I volunteered for deployment the second I graduated fellowship. Like I graduated fellowship. I came out here in Madigan. I called up the person that's in charge of assigning deployments and I said, put me on the next deployment. Dr. Kristen Mount, welcome to eShadowing. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? I am excellent. We have people rolling in. Um, as you are joining us, make sure you switch your Zoom chat to everyone so that everyone can see your questions and let us know where you are watching from. Um, we have Dr. Kristen Mount, who is a critical care medicine physician. Last week, we also had a critical care medicine doc on, um, but we're going to have an amazing conversation today about Dr. Mount's journey to where she is currently and talking about her specialty and we'll have some fun. So with that said, when, when someone says interesting critical care medicine, I mean, to me, right, as a physician, right, I have to like remove myself and put a lay, lay person's hat on. Like, crit, isn't all medicine really critical? Like what, what's so special about critical care medicine? That's a great question. Um, so I think what I like about critical care medicine is you get to take care of the sickest patients in the hospital, right? So hospital-based practice, hospital-based specialty, and I'm not a pulmonologist, okay. um, so I don't do outpatient pulmonary medicine. All I do all day, every day on services is, is critical care. And it's a privilege to be standing there in the ICU when, when patients come in and really need rapid, uh, you know, assessment, intervention, um, and, and just getting to take care of the sickest patients in the hospital, I think is yeah. a lot of fun. And I think that's what differentiates it from other specialties. We're kind of the final common pathway. So I take care of surgical patients, medical patients, obstetric patients, not pediatric. <laughs> yeah. Pediatric I do obviously different specialty, but um, so I get, I get my hands in a little bit of everything and people are really sick and I, I get instant gratification. Um, so I, I really like it. Been doing it a long time. I, I had a conversation earlier today with a, a very, a uh, very newbie pre-med student, uh, freshman in college, I think she was. And she's like, well, what about, what about EMT? Like, is that a good pre-med thing? I'm like, well, it is. And you have to like that environment. And I, I gave my, my own assessment of, right. Uh, when I was going through training, I love the OR, but I didn't really like the emergency room. I didn't like mm -hmm. that. There's a trauma case coming in and and everyone's scrambling and it's like urgent this and urgent that and blood squirting everywhere. And, oh my gosh, like <laughs> I my brain doesn't work that fast. Yeah. How did you get to a point where you're like, oh yeah, I, I like this fast paced environment. I like the 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 kind of like adrenaline rush uh, of doing all of that immediately versus just like, I'm going to ponder and think and <laughs> <laughs> review some right. up-to-date articles. Three hour rounds and lots of hyponatremia. <laughs> yeah, no, so it's a great question. And when I started off in medical school, so I should say my father is a retired obstetrician and gynecologic surgeon. So I always knew a little bit about <clears throat> OB and the labor deck and things like that, just from being around the house and listening to him take calls from his residents. But as I was applying to medical school, um, I really thought that I wanted to do primary care. I wanted to take care of the full age range of, of people uh, chronically over the course of their lives. And so that was kind of where my focus was early on until I started doing my clinical rotations as an MS3. And I remember distinctly, I was on my inpatient medicine rotation at Tripler Army Medical Center. And I was sitting there at morning report with the blueprints and medicine book. I don't even know if they have the blueprints series I, I anymore, but you remember, do. you probably oh, remember. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I was sitting there with the blueprints and medicine book and I had it open and I was taking notes in it. And one of the residents leaned over and said, what are you doing? And I said, this is fascinating, this is great stuff. And this is not nearly detailed enough for me. And so they said, you need to go do internal medicine. Like if you're taking notes, because this is not detailed enough for you, you should really think about internal medicine. And I thought long and hard over the course of that rotation. And um, then I did a family medicine rotation to compare. And I really missed the internal medicine aspect of that practice. And so I wanted, I wanted to do that. And so that was my first shift into internal medicine. Okay. And I knew nothing about it. So I went into my interview rotations 
It was a very last minute decision. I was switching rotations around. I landed uh, on a rheumatology rotation because all of the ward rotations were full. And uh, I thought rheumatology was fascinating. Um, it was a specialty I'd never even heard of. And so I was like, oh yeah, I wanna do rheumatology. And so I showed up to residency, um, fired up to do rheumatology. But as I progressed, um, where I was happiest and where I felt the most satisfaction in my practice was acute inpatient care. Mm -hmm. um, I loved the wards. I loved my ICU time even more. Um, rheumatology started to move into that black box where it lives for most of us, I think, which is fine, right? So yeah. I'm married to a rheumatologist. You just, can just have, me, you can just, have that. Just, just one point of clarification for someone listening and it's like, oh, wait, I'm confused. So you didn't go into your residency as a rheumatology resident. No, rheumatology no. is a fellowship after internal medicine. Yes, yes, sorry, that's correct. So I went yeah. into internal medicine, internship and residency. And then um, in the army around the beginning of your third year of three years of residency is when you have to decide if you want to apply for a fellowship or not. And so at that time, my, my interest was completely in the ICU and, and anytime, you know, somebody was out sick or needed coverage or extra ICU, ICU shifts need to be done. I was fired up and, and jumping in there and, and doing the ICU shifts. And so um, the next decision I had to make was whether to do pulmonary and critical care medicine or critical care medicine, right? Because there's a couple different fellowship paths that will get you ultimately to practice in the ICU. And um, I found that I really did not enjoy lung disease and the care of outpatient lung disease and, and the pulmonology spectrum, which I'm sure other guests have spoken to, but really is things like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, lung disease, interstitial lung diseases. Um, if, if the lungs weren't hooked up to a ventilator, I was not interested. <laughs> and so, and so that was pretty clear to me that that was really where I needed to be. And so I did, um, after I graduated residency, I was a uh, staff internist for a year. Again, just really making sure that I didn't want to stay uh, in general internal medicine and, and, I, and I didn't. And so I did a two-year critical care medicine fellowship and have not looked back since. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I know we're covering a lot of what's uh, on some of your slide deck. If you want to just go ahead and start sharing that, we can. Sure. I'm going to have to figure out how to share that first. Yeah. Share screen. All right. Hold on. Pull that up. Anybody watching potentially interested in critical care medicine? If not, maybe you will be now. <laughs> oh, I have a heart like that. Okay. Can you, can you guys see that? Uh, it is entirely possible I did not do this correctly. Yeah, it looks like we can. Yep. You can? Great. Yep. Okay, so first I just, I need to call everybody's attention to the disclaimer at the bottom. So yep. anything I say today is entirely my own opinion, um, whether that's great or it gets me into trouble. Um, nothing represents the Department of Defense, Defense Health Agency, or the Army. Um, so I'm on, I'm active duty in the army for another three months. I'll retire after 24 years of active duty service in June. Amazing. So um, I thought we could kind of roll through this a little bit today and I'm a fast talker. So we should have plenty of time at the end for questions and, and kind of discussion, but I wanted to go through a little bit who I am, how I got to where I, I am now, a little bit about army critical care medicine because army medicine is a little bit different. Um, what do I do? And then um, I talk a little bit about what my role is when I'm deployed, because that's that army aspect to my practice. So uh, I am at the very end of Gen X, which means I am adaptable to some technologies, but not all. And I'm OK with that. Um, I am the third generation of my family to serve on active duty. My dad um, was an army physician. My grandfather was an army artillery officer. There's a, a side of the family that's in the Navy. Um, we, we talk to them sometimes. So a little inner service family rivalry. So Army medicine is something I grew up in. It's something that's always been familiar for me. I did my undergrad at the University of Scranton in Pennsylvania, and then I went directly to medical school at the Uniform Services University. Um, after medical school, I did my GME training, and then there's a really long list of jobs that I have done kind of back and forth. Um, I mentioned before, my husband is an army physician. He is a rheumatologist. So rheumatology is autoimmune and inflammatory diseases affecting the joints and skin and, and some of the internal organs. And then he's done specialty training in uveitis, um, which is inflammatory eye disease. 
And then we have three little boys, uh, eight, six, and four. And uh, yeah, I yeah. know. It's yeah. <laughs> I, I have a nine and a four-year-old, so you get it. <laughs> I'm glad I don't have one in between. <laughs> this is like, I, we pick, I pick this hour specifically because everybody's either napping or at school, so it should be quiet. <laughs> Um, and we needed reproductive assistance to have all of those. That was an unpleasant surprise um, that uh, we struggled with infertility. So um, I can certainly answer questions about that. I'm more than willing to talk about that. And then, like I said, I'm getting ready to retire from the Army. Uh, my plan is to stay active in the ICU about 10 to 12 weeks a year and then uh, continue along some of the professional work I've been doing with the American College of Physicians and the Society of Critical Care Medicine. Um, so like I said, so some of you are pre-med and um, you may have heard about, uh, and, and those of you um, who are pre-pre-med, you may have heard about the HPSP scholarship, which is the Health Professions Scholarship Program, and the Uniform Services University of the Health Sciences. And those are, so the HPSP, Army, Navy, and Air Force have scholarships that um, once you get accepted to medical school, you apply for the scholarship, you kind of do that in tandem. And if you are accepted for the scholarship, then your medical school is paid for and you get a stipend. The um, VA also has HPSP. Yes, now. I don't know if you know that. Yes, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and then um, USU is the milit active duty military medical school um, in Bethesda, Maryland. So right across the street from the NIH campus. And the difference with Uniformed Services University is that you actually come on to active duty and you're technically in a reserve status, um, Army, Navy, Air Force, Public Health Service. And it's a traditional allopathic four-year medical school, the same stuff everybody else learns, plus a little bit of military medicine. Um, and then when you graduate, your payback is a little bit different. So with an HPSP scholarship, you owe kind of time for how many years they pay for after your residency is completed. With USU, you owe seven years. So it's a little bit of a longer payback. Um, I was accepted to both. Um, I got an HPSP scholarship and I was accepted to Georgetown. Um, uh, Georgetown Medical School was my first choice. And then I got accepted to USIS. And I, I chose to go to USU because I knew I wanted to do Army Medicine. It was kind of a, the fami actually familiar for me. Um, and so I chose USU. And we talked about how you know I was interested initially in primary care and family medicine. I kind of pivoted at the end thought maybe rheumatology, and then I pivoted again at the end of PGY-3. And it's funny because I can remember as a medical student, as an MS-1 and MS-2, you know, the older, wiser threes and fours would, they'd ask, oh, what specialty are you thinking? And I'd say family medicine, and they'd say, oh, you'll change your mind. And it used to infuriate me. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a type A decisive person, and it made me yeah. so mad. And then here I was, you know, spinning in circles, pivot number one and pivot number two. So yeah. um, don't last, count anything out. <laughs> the, the last data that I saw, I, I don't know if they they uh, keep asking this question because I haven't seen updated data, but the last time I saw the data was 75% of students changed their mind. I believe, I think um, a lot of us have some preconceived notions when we start um, based on our experience with medicine. And then once you get into those clinical clerkships, I think that really helps narrow down the specialty for a lot of people. And some of that is less about the medicine and more about the personalities you encounter, right? Yeah. So yeah. Know, there are some people that, that may love a specialty, but their clerkships were so miserable that it kind of yep. turns them off. So yeah, I, I think totally the, see that. The, the majority of physicians that I talk to for, for eShadowing or for my podcast I used to do called Specialty Stories is, is mentorship. It yeah. seems like so many people find their specialty through mentorship, which, which is why it's one of the reasons I tell students, like, don't look at match lists for schools to to decide where you want to go to school, because your personality may jive with some of the the different personalities of, of attendings that may lead you down a different path than than other students who have gone to that school. So I tell people the same thing. Um, I do a lot of interviews for residents that are that are interested in matching and and I always get the question, well, why should I come here? Why shouldn't I go someplace else? And, and the answer is that I always give is, it really depends on the vibe of the place that you're at. Yeah. And when you find the specialty that you like, when you find the medical school that you like, when you find the residency program that you like, you're gonna know because it's gonna feel right. Yeah. And so um, numbers play into that a little bit, but yeah. And, and no decision that you ever make for the most part is final. And so that's, I think, uh, I don't think people tell 
um, pre-med and medical students that, that, you know, these are big, hefty, weighty decisions that, that we're making. And it feels like the very rest of your life depends on it. But yeah. in truth, it's kind of not really the case. And so um, you can change your mind. You can do different things. You can do different specialties. You can not do clinical medicine. And so I'll show you here. Um, this is kind of all of the stuff that I've done over my career. Um, what's great about being in the army is that you're generally not pinned down to one silo of medicine. You can do a little bit of everything depending on where you're stationed and what jobs you want to put yourself in for. So, um, I do clinical medicine. I do academic clinical medicine. Um, I, I've done a lot with the professional medical organizations related to internal medicine and critical care medicine. I do research. And then um, the latter half of my career was really spent doing a lot of healthcare admin and strategic leadership. So it kind of bounced around. And, and it's funny, you know, when I reflect back, when I was kind of looking back at how to frame this slide, there's a lot of places where these circles actually cross over um, and, and touch each other and, and move in and out. And so it's, a, it's actually been a very dynamic process. And I don't think that's necessarily limited to military medicine. I think there are those opportunities out there um, to, to try a bunch of different things and, and see what you like. So um, in terms of clinical medicine, I have really spent my entire career up here in Tacoma, Washington at Madigan Army Medical Center. And that's unusual for the Army. It kind of comes down to the fact that uh, because my husband is super subspecialized, there's really only a couple places that they can put the two of us together. And so a large training platform is one of those places. Um, and we train everybody. Um, so I've taught uh, medical students. We've had pre-medical students come shadow um, before COVID. That was uh, easier to do, right? Medics, um, nurses, we've got units on joint base lewis McCord where, um, that we'll do skills refresher for. So I've done kind of a lot of outreach there. I am one of three intensivists. Um, there were two of us that are critical care medicine, one that's emergency medicine, critical care medicine. And, uh, and five pulmonologists. And we have a mixed open model in our ICU. And so what that means is that there are some surgical subspecialties that admit their own patients and write their own orders and care for their own patients and be consult. And then everybody else um, comes to me. And so that's that spectrum where I get to take care of urology and neurosurgical patients and medicine and family medicine patients. So a um, day in life. So when I'm on the clinical service, um, you know, this is kind of what my day looks like. So I start at seven in the morning, we meet there, we get a very quick sign out from the nighttime resident. This is the opportunity for us to find out if there's anybody who's really sick that needs attention right now, um, catch things that, that maybe perhaps went unnoticed overnight and start the wheels in motion to care for those patients before we do teaching rounds. Um, 8.30 rounds start and they go until complete, but... Um, I, I kind of always tell the residents that if we start at 8.30, at 10.30, we're done um, for two reasons. First of all, I don't have the attention span to stand around and round for three or four hours, which, which this is like the non-internist part of me coming out, right? <laughs> I don't have the attention span. I cannot stand there for three hours, you know, waxing philosophic about things. But also because in the ICU, right? If you're rounding for two hours, then the very first patient you talked about is a completely different patient by the end of those two hours because their clinical situation develops rapidly. And so we got to be efficient. We have to be quick and we do some teaching time, but, but the, the goal is to not spend all morning rounding. Um, we got to be in there taking care of our patients. How so many after, beds typically do you have? So at my hospital, we have 20 beds, um, so two ICUs, and they're all kind of blended in. Um, you know, there are different models. So one of the hospitals that I work at um, has a neuro ICU and then kind of a cardiac ICU that everybody goes there. There are other places that have designated surgical, neurosurgical burn, that sort of thing. Um, for us, we're just kind of a take all comers into the beds that we have. And uh, so after rounds, we write notes, we do family meetings. Um, we can talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then in the afternoon, we come back with the nighttime attending and we do a quick sign out round. So we kind of walk around briefly. These last about 20, 20 to 30 minutes just to check up and see how have things changed since rounds? Did we get done everything we needed to get done today? 
Um, then I go back to my office, I sign notes and do email. And then I have to be home by 5.30. So we have a nanny and she works for us from 6.30 in the morning to 5.30 at night. So the, the be home in the door time for me is 5.30. Wow. And then uh, clinically, um, right now I do some occasional work in some civilian hospitals and those are uh, all night shifts and it's a non-academic ICU. So I did a week of nights last week um, and there are, there are 42 ICU beds and it's me and the nurses. Um, so not all of the patients are always mine, but that's a completely different environment. It's actually a lot, it's actually a lot of fun. <laughs> you can see, you can see I'm a glutton for punishment. It's actually a lot of fun. Um, because I get to do everything myself kind of hands-on at the bedside instead of standing back and teaching. So, um, when we talk about academics, so some of the academic stuff I do, um, I should say, so there was a, another kind of pivot or, um, a, a training step back. So in 20. 20, um, I was exiting an administrative job and I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but I had always had an interest in point of care ultrasound. Um, it was essentially non-existent when I was a resident. And then of course, you know, you can't, you can't swing a probe in the hospital without hitting somebody else that's carrying their own probe. So <laughs> I was really, I was really interested. Um, and it's becoming a more important part of ICU practice. And do, I, and I, do you think that's because we have as as an as a medical world found more value in ultrasound or do you think the technology is so portable and cheap nowadays that everyone can have a probe i think it's both actually i think um i i can tell i, I can see that for me personally um if i have a question a clinical question on a night so let me give you an example um, one of the most dangerous things that you can do in the ICU is transport a critically ill patient someplace else in the hospital. There's so much that can go wrong between when you pack that patient up, you put them on transport monitors, and you're dragging IVs, sometimes a ventilator, through the hospital hallway to wherever you need to go, that you really need to make sure that, that you are transporting the patient for the right reason. And um, what I love using ultrasound for in the ICU is answering some of those questions. So for example, um, at, every now and then you have a patient that's been there for a while and they're doing okay. And then all of a sudden it looks like they're getting infected again. It looks like they have early sepsis. And you're usually already aware of all of the normal sources. So urinary tract, lungs, um, usually, not, um, usually not abdominal infection, except for gallbladder infection. So cholecystitis, um, can sometimes creep up on you in the ICU. And normally in order to diagnose that, you need to do some additional radiology imaging. Well, I can look with my probe at, a, at the gallbladder and I can decide whether it's more or less likely that the patient has cholecystitis. And based on that decision, it, it helps me decide whether it's worth the risk to go down for confirmatory um, confirmatory studies. So I think that's, that is a use that we kind of didn't have before, but because the technology has gotten better and more portable and cheaper, um, that, that we're able to do those things now. So I think it's really interesting. I knew nothing about it. Um, so I went and did a one-year fellowship. We have an emergency ultrasound fellowship at my hospital. Um, the army was crazy and let me do it. I think I was the oldest uh, GME person in the army at the time, full colonel. Um, and so a lot of the teaching that I do now is related to point of care ultrasound. Uh, I do some life support class teaching. Uh, I mentor a lot of residents. And then um, I sit on some of the committees for the internal medicine residency program. Um, and then I also precept medical students from USU. So they rotate out with us for their internal medicine clerkship. And about once or twice a year, I, I pick up a crew and, and I do some precepting for them. So professional medical organizations. So this is something that you can be involved in as a medical student. So most of the large professional specialty societies have medical student sections or their state chapters have opportunities for medical students to get involved. So if you're not involved yet, um, take a look at that. A lot of the societies have um, free 
uh, memberships for medical students. And you don't have to completely, so for example, for the ACP, you don't have to decide hard and fast, I'm going into internal medicine. You can join the ACP and check it out and see if you like what you're seeing. I was a member of the American Academy of Family Physicians. Um, I was a member of the ACP as a, as a medical student. So um, lots of great programming going on uh, in these professional societies. So I was the governor of the Army chapter of the ACP, um, and currently I'm a member of their performance measurement committee. So what we do is um, when somebody comes out and uh, says, well, we want to grade doctors on how well they do diabetes care, for example, um, they'll come up with some measures and some metrics to measure. And because the American College of Physicians is a big stakeholder in that, they'll send those to us. And as a committee, we, we look at them and evaluate them and advise kind of what we think about that. So that's been really interesting. And then uh, I'm the outgoing chair of the Uniform Services section of Society of Critical Care Medicine. And I sit on their ultrasound course committee and I teach their ultrasound course, their adult ultrasound course. So um, that's what I do in the professional medical organization realm. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot. I know. I, there, was, like, <laughs> there was one point where I was looking at this and I was like, good Lord. And a lot of this, as I said, is overlapping. And I don't know how I did a lot of this at the same time, but I did. It's probably why my hair is getting gray. <laughs> I'm so tired. Um, so most of my research is clinical based. Um, I'm, I'm not a bench science researcher. My sister is, has a PhD in microbiology and she does bench science research at the University of Washington. And when she tells me what she's doing, I don't understand it. Um, it's, it's like all of that chemistry knowledge and biochemistry knowledge that I had as an undergrad is completely gone. So all of my research has been clinical based and I've been interested in sepsis and resuscitation of sepsis. Um, uh, I've done, so you see on their PICS, which is post-intensive care syndrome, which I think we're going to start seeing more about as we delve into long COVID and PICS is a, um, a kind of a constellation of findings. So when patients survive critical illness, they have trouble um, with neurocognitive deficits. They have trouble with um, musculoskeletal weakness. And, and there's a lot you know, that a body goes through to survive a critical illness. And so PICS is something that really impacts a lot of patients. I have an interest in that. And I think we're gonna see more of that as we learn a little bit more about long COVID and, and some of the fallout from, from patients who have survived that. Um, I do field-based POCUS research. So you can see the pictures there. Um, that's, my, that's my friend, Scott Grogan. He was my co-fellow. He's also old. Um, and uh, we, we were looking for a way. So if you're gonna do an ultrasound of small parts, so hands, toes, things like that, you need to have um, a medium to provide distance between the body part and the end of the probe because the probe has a certain focal length that you wanna align with the body part to get the best image. So traditionally there are pads, like gel pads that you can buy and you can use, you can see you've got a big basin of water there. Well, the problem for army medicine, when we deploy, we don't have all that stuff. In some places we do, but in a lot of places we don't. And where we're starting to send point of care ultrasound, it's in a backpack with a medic very far forward. And so we were trying to figure out, well, what could they use? So let's say somebody comes to you and you're concerned they have an abscess in their hand and an abscess in the hand is gonna mean you know, different treatment, right? So a, a, an, an infection like that needs to be opened surgically and drained. That's a big deal if you are engaged in a firefight. That's probably not something that you want to take somebody away and send them back for treatment for. So you could use point of care ultrasound to look at that swelling on the hand and decide if it was an abscess. Um, but to do that, you would need one of these standoff pads or a bucket of water. And so we were trying to find something else that we know is readily available um, that a medic would have and IV fluid bag is it. So we tested a bunch of different sizes of IV fluid bags and uh, <clears throat> looked at the quality of the images. And, and it turns out, uh, I think it was, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it was 150 cc IV fluid bag will get you the right focal length. Um, and you can just whip that right out of your out of your um, aid pack, throw it on there with a, just a tiny bit of gel, um, KY jelly, whatever you have, and it works beautifully. So 
Um, that's the kind of goofy stuff that I come up with. This is not, <laughs> there's no, there's no, you know, randomized prospective placebo controlled trials necessarily. Um, I, I, we did some of that during COVID. We were a site for the um, studies that were looking at remdesivir and some of the autoimmune medicines. Um, and that was kind of fun. And then what I really love doing is I love mentoring medical students and residents on publications and presentations. Um, it's a lot of fun. I think of case reports as kind of the gateway, so to speak, into larger clinical research, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, most of what you're learning as a medical student is how to record data, right? How to report, record data and write an HMP. And that's in its essence, what a case report is. And so then it lets you take a skill that you know well, because you've been learning it and add the new skill of writing something for publication and going through that process of, of publishing a manuscript. So I really like doing that a lot. Wow. Um, okay. So the army does not let you exist as only a physician. So we're physicians and officers and with officership comes leadership. And so um, I did a lot of leadership jobs. I was the first woman to be the chief of medicine at my hospital. Uh, and after, after that job for about three years, and so this is the difference between army medicine, uh, military medicine, civilian medicine is you rotate in and out of these jobs very rapidly because part of it is to build the bench behind you. Part of it is for career progression. So nobody sits in a chair of medicine job for 10, 15, 20 years. That's not a thing. Um, and then I, so out of that job, I was selected to be the deputy commander of medical services. So um, I was in charge of all of primary care, emergency medicine, behavioral health, department of medicine, and pediatrics. So all of those departments fell under me, and my day looked exactly like this. <laughs> so we'd, we'd have a daily safety huddle where you would hear everything in the hospital that was an issue that needed to be fixed, that sort of thing, and announcements would put out. We'd go into the commander's conference room and meet with him. Uh, and that's where we would talk about some of the more military specific things. And then it was meetings, 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 email meetings, email meetings. And then again, home by 530 because nanny leaves. I got to be home by 530. So I cut my schedule off. Um, and that picture at the bottom there. So that um, I was almost done with that job in March of 2020 when the COVID pandemic started. And we had to figure out very quickly. We had two things going on. So we had some medical units on Joint Base Lewis-McChord that were getting ready to go deploy to fall in on um, up in Seattle, some to the Javits Center, um, which you may have heard of. Um, and so we are primarily responsible for getting them medically ready to go. And then we had our own patients and our own staff that we needed to take care of. And so we built this, um, this was in a parking lot across the street from the hospital and it was our offsite COVID testing site. So we had to, we had to figure out how to build that up. And the great thing, I, I'm just going to indulge me this really quick. So one of my favorite things about this was we had our site stood up for about three or four weeks and we were losing medical personnel because we needed them back in the hospital, taking care of patients. And then some of them were deploying. And so we kind of asked across post, well, Hey, you know, we need some help manning the, you know, the COVID testing site. And the, um, the dental group threw their hands up and fell on the testing site. And so it was the, it was the dental technicians, the, our dentists, our oral maxillofacial surgeons, they loved it. And so <laughs> they ran this thing like a clockwork. It was beautiful. And they were so excited and they were so enthusiastic. And it was just, it was my, it's my, one of my favorite stories uh, because they just, they really kind of embraced that mission. Um, so that was a lot of the stuff that I did and a lot, a lot of things that, you know, we were dealing with. And, and unfortunately I kind of phased out of that job into fellowship, which had been predetermined before, um, before the pandemic started. But um, that was, that was an interesting time. So it's a bit about deployment. Um, lots of ways that are, that physicians are deployed in the army. So first of all, they're not deployed as residents. Um, we, that, that happened in um, Gulf War One. And everybody soon realized that, that was a terrible idea because it was extremely disruptive to GME. So um, the military medical students um, on HPSP and USU are non-deployable. And so uh, are GME, so residents and fellows. Um, 
And when I deploy as a critical care physician, it tends to be with field hospitals and those can be in tent hospitals or in what we call fixed facilities. So buildings that we have fallen in on that we've converted into hospitals. Um, there, uh, you're responsible for patient care. I did skills training and maintenance of nurses and medics. So BLS, ACLS, let's do some trauma simulations, that sort of thing. Um, I advised the command on all things related to critical care medicine and evacuation. And then we did some local outreach. So um, I was in Iraq for six months and near the end of my deployment, we convoyed down into Baghdad to one of their teaching hospitals. And we did kind of a joint grand rounds with Iraqi physicians and with some American military physicians. It was very, very cool. It was very humbling. Um, you know, to, to see, to see, for example, they did not have a blood banking system, just didn't, didn't exist. Um, they didn't have, we were talking with a cardiologist and they, they don't have a way to check troponin, right? They don't have a way to check cardiac enzymes to help determine whether somebody's had a heart attack, a myocardial infarction or not. And so the compare and contrast of kind of what we have here um, in community hospitals and state-of-the-art medical centers compared to what exists elsewhere was a great learning point. It was a, kind of a highlight for me. Hmm. Um, and so I wanted to throw this in because I don't know that as physicians, we talk about this a lot, but there's a whole person outside of all of the job, right? So there's a whole person who, who is there before work and after work and um, things from life intrude during work. Sometimes it's great and sometimes it's a pain. And so this is me, um, um, these are my, this is who I am. I have family, so my husband and, and my kids. Um, I'm obviously a physician and I love to garden. Um, up here in the Pacific Northwest, we actually have a lot of sun. It's like the hidden secret, don't tell anybody, but summer is beautiful. We'll go, we'll go, <laughs> we'll go 60 plus days without rain. It's just stunning. Um, I'm getting back into some photography, amateur photography, and I love cooking. And so um, that picture right there, this was like the best meal I've ever had in my life. It was a bunch of friends. Um, we went out in a boat, we dropped crab pots, pulled up some Dungeness crab, brought it back. Um, Dungeness crab, salmon burgers, sitting outside. There's no mosquitoes up here. So not only is the weather beautiful in the summer, but there's not, it's not humid. There's no mosquitoes. I got eaten alive by mosquitoes in the DC area. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, what we do. There's, there's people outside of, of work. And for a long time, I think it feels like you can't have a life outside of work. Um, but, but eventually you can, I think that maybe, I think those are all my slides. Awesome. So, uh, Lisa asked a question before you got into that slide uh, right before. She said, uh, as you're both active duty, how do you handle these unexpected potential child care issues? Now, you, you said you do have a nanny, um, but sometimes the nanny gets sick, right? How do you how do you deal with that? It's disastrous. That's a great <laughs> it's a great question. So um, the reason we got a nanny at first was um, when my first son was born. That was right when my husband had been accepted to fellowship in Portland. Um, and so he was going to go down there for fellowship. And I'm an ICU doctor. I was coming back off of maternity leave. I can't, I can't be held to the drop-off pickup times of daycare. Yeah. Um, and so that was how we got our nanny. And, and bless her, she has stayed with us. <laughs> She's been with us for eight, for eight years. Um, and and it's, a, it's a juggle. It is a juggle. It helps that my schedule as an intensivist, if I'm not in the unit, is completely at my flexibility. I can be very flexible if I'm not clinically assigned to be in the ICU. My husband's schedule as a, as a rheumatologist, which is a clinic-based specialty, um, and he also does some leader and professional development fellowship work, um, is slightly less flexible. So when we have conflict, you know, we sit down and we say, okay, well, can you cover here? And I can cover here. All right, I'll come home at noon and then you can go and see your afternoon clinic. So it's, it's a balance. Um, we've been able to escape deployment at the same time. 
Yeah, I was I was going to ask about that deployment was, that because was, well, that was the big one. Yeah, many yeah. many people aren't aware. As a military member, your main job basically is to be ready to deploy at mm-hmm. any time. And so, just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you don't deploy, as you you showed some of those images. How how have deployments worked as uh, as a parent, as a spouse, as all of that fun stuff? Well, so this so we we knew we were going to get deployed. And we knew it was going to be after fellowship and we knew we wanted to start a family. And I was really worried about having to leave a small baby at home. Um, At the time in the army, you were non-deployable at the time. You were non-deployable for six months postpartum. That's now changed. It's longer appropriately. So, but I was like, man, I was like, man, I don't want to leave a six month old baby. Um, How was George going to breastfeed? Right. So so I, um, I volunteered for deployment the second I graduated fellowship. Like I graduated fellowship. I came out here in Madigan. I called up the person that's in charge of assigned deployments. And I said, put me on the next deployment. Mm-hmm. Um, my husband was at Walter Reed for another year, but he was deploying with a unit out of Fort Bragg. And so we're like, this is perfect. We're both going to deploy at the same time. The only dependent we had was a dog. We took her down to my sister-in-law's in Arizona and she stayed down there. And so we kind of overlapped and got that deployment out of the way. Yeah. Um, and then, and then um, I came back from deployment and figured, yay, let's have kids. And then it did not work out on that timeline. So I got very fortunate that I had bosses that were willing to um, give me enough work to do that I could kind of uh, use assisted reproduction. So we went through a lot of IVF to have our kids. And um, that kind of helped to avoid co-deploying again but George he deployed in 2012 for another he was there for five months this time to a field hospital in Afghanistan and um, we just kind of have gotten lucky since then that any time away has been much much shorter and not overlap but it is sheer is luck because that is not the case for all families so we have a family care plan um, and the plan is that my mom would come up and stay in between my mom and, and our nanny kids would be covered. Yeah. It just yeah. for for people watching listening right now, right? As you mentioned, right? <laughs> Dr. Mount mentioned it's luck. The military doesn't Total. look and go, "Oh, Dr. Mount, <laughs> wife Dr. Mount, your your husband's deployed, so we're not going to deploy you," right? It's whatever they need is what you do and you are expected to have that family care plan to deal yeah. with kids if both parents are deployed. Exactly. It's actually required by regulation that if two, if parents are active duty, um, that you have to have a family care plan in place in case that happens. Um, you know, and some, so some of the work that I have just handed over recently, I'm the, I was the consultant to the Army Surgeon General for Critical Care Medicine. And part of that also includes matching up people into deployments. And so um, if you have a good consultant, um, you know, you can massage a little bit of that for people. So I was yeah. able to, to deploy this guy before he and his, um, his wife, who's a pediatric endocrinologist had to move overseas and I, yeah. I can get this guy in <laughs> so that he should be home by the time baby three is born. it is, it is. Yeah. And, and there are good people that are working to make that happen. But at the end of the day, the needs of the army are the needs of the army and, and you just got to roll with it. Always. And be yeah. Lucky. So be lucky. Uh, when when I was and I don't know if you know this, I was HPSP um, for the Air Force, and so there was an there was a moment where uh, I got a call from from the consultant that was doing deployments, and they're like, "Hey, do you want to deploy?" <laughs> <I'm> like <laughs> when? And they're like, uh, "This time period." And my wife, I was I was stationed in Dover, Delaware. She was up mm-hmm. in Boston doing her residency, so we lived apart the first two years of our marriage. Because again, the needs of the Air Force trumped yeah. me wanting to live with my wife. Um, and I was like, oh, that's a, that's a horrible time because <laughs> she she had like a six-week elective block where she was going to come down and, and live with me for, for those mm-hmm. six weeks. And, and the, the consultant was like, great, no problem. We'll, we'll, we'll find someone else. So yeah. um, they're flexible when they can be. And if they mm-hmm. can't be, <laughs> be prepared. Be prepared. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, if anyone wants to come on and ask a question, I will allow you to unmute yourself. If you have a question for Dr. Mount, um, you can just raise your hand in Zoom. Use a little raise hand feature. Uh, anything about military medicine, critical care medicine, 
um, wearing lots of hats. I think that's the the big thing that I'll I'll lead with um, is uh, obviously you go to medical school to to become a physician, but that doesn't teach you to be a leader, to be a boss. How did you get those skills? Is it just you you stumble enough and you figure it out, or? Do you have any good recommendations for reads? Where, where do you yeah, get? Yeah, so that's a that's a really great question. Um, you know, the army teaches you a little bit of that. So I got some of that in in a in a semi formal curriculum at Uniform Services University. So they have now an actual formal uh, formal leadership curriculum. But when I went through, it was it was it was kind of an undercurrent there um, that you were learning some leadership principles and concepts, um, and you pick those up through different courses in the army. A lot of what I did was um, make mistakes. Uh, so, you know, I, I was the director of critical care services right out of fellowship. Um, then I was the chief of the pulmonary critical care sleep service. And um, I, I made mistakes, but I had really good mentors. So I had people that would pull me aside and would give me good feedback and say, hey, you know, you stumbled hard there. I recommend you not do this that way again. Um, I will be honest. There are a lot of people that have great lists of leadership books. I don't learn that way. Yeah. Um, you know, I read, I read leadership books. I'm like, this is the best concept. I love this. And it is in one ear and out the other. <laughs> and I just, and so over time, as I read these books, I think I'm, I'm pulling things together kind of in, in my head. Um, and, and yeah, I, I also like what I call uh, leader adjacent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so there are all sorts of things that you can consume in terms of media, um, podcasts, TV, movies, books, um, you know, social media that are not directly advertised as leadership, but are teaching some of those leader adjacent principles. And because they're more enjoyable to watch as you're, or read, as you're engaging with that, you know, I think in my head, oh, if I was this character, or I was this person, or if I was posting this, you know, what, what would I do in that same situation? And that's actually exercising leadership skills, right? Yeah. So, um, oh, I, I, I just finished watching the, the, um, the last of us and I'm not going to spoil oh, anything. Don't spoil but it. I'm on episode seven. <laughs> no, but there's, but there, but there's a lot of opportunity, right? As yeah. the characters are making decisions and as they're engaging situations, there's a lot of opportunity to say, gosh, if I were that person in, in, with these resources in this type of scenario, good Lord, I hope we're never in that type of scenario. <laughs> but if I was, how would I handle that? Would I handle it the same way differently? And, and that kind of mental practice ultimately I think helps you solidify your leadership style and, yep. and then you'll have an opportunity to practice that in person. Right. And that can be anything from dealing with microaggressions. Um, what if you have a really terrible, you know, I, we talked a little bit at the beginning about terrible clerkships, right? So that experience on the clerkships conflict with nursing staff conflict with a resident conflict with your peers, you know, how do you handle that? So um, I don't, I don't have a bunch of you know, specific titles to read. I just look for those leadership adjacent opportunities and practice that a lot. And then I made yeah. a lot of mistakes. Yeah. They made make a, lot a lot of mistakes. Of mistakes. And, and you need people to give you feedback. So yeah. you've got to fi find somebody, a friend, an instructor, a mentor, a relative, somebody who will give you honest feedback about when you screwed up. Because yeah. that's the only way that you learn. Yeah. My, my colleague says, find someone who respects you more than loves you because the people who love you want to protect you. Yeah. The people who respect you will, will give you that tough feedback. Yeah. That's a great, I love that. Yeah. Uh, Elizabeth, you have a question? Yeah. I was wondering if um, you or colleagues had any experience with um, going into one type of military medicine and then after finishing your service with um, the military kind of like going back for a fellowship or changing routes. Cause I I've heard you have, you have a certain amount of what you can choose, but then kind of where they need you, they'll put you. So I was just wondering if you've known anyone who's done that. So um, 
There are, yes. So in short, I know people that started off as, as one specialty and gravitated towards something else and were able to identify jobs that would work for that. I know people that have finished their military service and have gone on to do fellowships or additional residency training once they've concluded their service because they they you know wanted to do something else. Um, I have colleagues in military medicine that started off as, um, uh, so I have friends that started off as internal medicine, then they did a nuclear medicine fellowship. Then they realized that outside of the military, you really can't get a job doing nuclear medicine unless you're radiology trained. So then they did radiology. And then one of them really loved interventional. So now she's an interventional radiologist. Um, the nice thing about being able to do that in the military is that the only thing it costs you is time. So every time you add training, you add to the time that you have to pay back in the military. Um, on, the other, on the other hand, um, outside of the military, you have a limited number of training years that are paid for, as I understand it. Yeah. And so that somewhat limits your ability to make a large career move you know, from one specialty to another. Um, but there are certainly people I know that have been clinical medicine their entire careers, they leave. Um, they leave the military and they go into research and development. They go into um, administration type jobs. They go into business, like completely different away from medicine and businesses. And so I think that that's you, what I try to remind the residents that I, I mentor a lot is, hey, you've got your entire adult life, you know, the rest of your adult life in front of you and lots of options and opportunities. The military will limit that somewhat, but but also civilian life, you know, you, you have those limits. So mm -hmm. it, it, um, it, they can't say no if you don't ask. Do you know, you know what I mean? So the, the worst that yeah. somebody's going to say if you ask is, no, we're not going to let you do that. And, and then you can decide whether you're going to pursue the same goal in, in another avenue or um, whether you're going to take that and, and go back and do something different. So I don't know yeah. if I answered your question. It was a little rambly. Yeah, I did. I think <laughs> you did. I, I think, yeah, I I think the thing to, to add to that is, as always, is the, the needs of the military. Um, for instance, the Air Force, as far as I know, still doesn't have um, PM and R docs. So mm -hmm. physical medicine and rehabilitation is not a specialty that Air Force physicians can do. Therefore, if you are a USU med student or an HPSP med student and you fall in love with PM&R, tough luck. <laughs> you, you need to go somewhere else. And so I, I had a student several years ago who um, I, I worked with who fell in love with PM&R and, and he ended up going to family medicine because he was, he was an Air Force HPSP. Um, and and added sports medicine training onto his family medicine training to kind of scratch that itch for himself. Mm -hmm. But um, a, as you said, Doctor Mount, the um, it's it's not talked about often, but the residency spots out in the civilian world are subsidized by the government, and they only give each individual person a certain. Uh, basically dollar amount or number of years for for GME training. Um, and so it's very hard to finish a residency and go back and do another residency. Mm -hmm. It's possible, but the hospital that's going to train you probably isn't going to get uh, their subsidized funding from the government. And so they're going to have to be willing to to pay a bigger chunk for you. So it's not talked about often, but there's, there's that mm -hmm. underlying... Um, thing that happens there. Uh, we probably have time for one more question. If you have one, raise your hand. Um, if not, we can let Dr. Mount go before her little one wakes up <laughs> from a nap. <laughs> um, yeah, nobody's raising their hand. So we'll let All you right. go, Dr. Mount. Thank you so much Great. for your time today. Um, I appreciate uh, you spending the time sharing your wisdom and good luck with your transition out of the military, out into the civilian Thank world. You. Thank you. I had, to, I had to have somebody show me how to go buy civilian clothes. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, what do you I'm mean? Like, you don't just go to your workplace and they give you more clothes. <laughs> I mean, I'm either in scrubs or army uniforms like for 24 years. So thank you very much. I really had a great time. Um, I am on Twitter at Mount underscore MD. Um, I, I don't post a ton, but I, I do a little bit of everything on there. And um, certainly you can contact me with any other questions. Um, I'm always happy to talk. So thank awesome. you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Have a good day, everyone.